switching. So we need to now talk about what is packet switching and compare that to circuit switching. And in fact, there are two types of packet switching, so we'll go through both of them first. So we saw one of the problems with circuit switching is it can be inefficient because the source may spend a lot of time not sending the maximum rate. In fact, the source may spend a lot of time being idle, not sending anything, and that's very inefficient in terms of the use of the network. So packet switching has been developed, and we'll talk about how it works. But importantly, in packet switching, the source, which has some data to send, breaks that into packets. So we divide the data, and the data represented in a binary form, into packets of usually some maximum size. And those packets contain a portion of the data that we want to send from source to destination, and we'll usually need some header information to help the delivery of those packets. So the source divides the data in the packets, and we send the packets through our switching network. And then, either at the destination or just before they leave the switching network, the packets will be combined and we get our original application data. So we send packets through our switching network, and hence we get a packet switching network. So a different concept now. We're not talking about sending a signal from source all the way to the destination. Now we're dealing with binary data always, and we're dealing with taking the data that we want to communicate from source to destination and sending it in small chunks, in packets. And the packet switching network, there are two different approaches for delivering those packets to the destination. Datagram packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. In datagram packet switching, what we do is, if the source has some data to send, it breaks it into packets and sends those packets into the network, so to the next packet switching network, uh, packet, packet switching node, and that packet switching node then sends the packets to another packet switching node, and they forward them on until the packets reach the destination. With datagram packet switching, the packets are treated independently, so if our source, our source computer has, as an example, 3,000 bytes of data, that's the data it wants to communicate to the destination. We divide that data into packets, and normally a, a network or a technology would specify what's the maximum size or the maximum amount of data that can be included in a packet. So as an example, let's say the maximum we can include in one of our packets is 1,000 bytes. So we break this data <coughs> into three packets. Packet 1, which would contain 1,000 bytes of data, and we would need a header. And the size of the header would normally be defined as well, the size and structure of the header. As an example, let's say we have a 20-byte header. And we'd have two more packets of the same structure. So just a simple example where we have 3,000 bytes of data to send. That'll be divided into three packets at the source node. And that source node will send those packets to the destination, oh, sorry, to the, the next packet switching node. So across the first link. In datagram packet switching, those packets are treated independently. That is, the first packet switching node will receive three packets, and the source will send in order packet one, then packet two, then packet three. It transmits them across the line one at a time. When the first packet switching node receives the first packet, it looks at the packet, in particular the header, to determine where is it going to send this packet to reach the destination D. So the header would include some information 
particular the destination address to indicate to the switching nodes where to send this packet so that we reach the destination. The first packet switching node will deal with that packet and send it across the next link to the next packet switching node. And then so on. The next packet, so the source sends three packets, one after another. When packet two arrives at the first packet switching node, in datagram packet switching, that packet is treated independent of the previous packet. That's what we say they're treated independently of all others. That is, the packet switching node receives a packet from the source, packet one, decide, looks at it, decides to send in this direction to reach the destination. Then the packet switching node receives another packet. It doesn't care that it came from the same source as the previous packet. It doesn't know that the second packet is actually related to the same piece of original data as the first packet. It treats them independent just of two different packets and therefore may look at that packet, make a decision, OK, I need to send that to some destination over there. It may decide to send it in a different direction. So in datagram packet switching, all packets are treated independently. There's no, from the packet switching nodes perspective, they don't care whether this one is related to this one or not. They may treat them differently. We'll see an example as the packets throw, flow through a network shortly. And as a result, because the packet switching nodes may treat the packets different, it may turn out that they take different paths through a network. One packet may go in this direction to the destination at the back, one may go in a different direction. So that's possible. And as a result, they may arrive at the destination out of order. Even though the source sends packet 1, then packet 2, then packet 3, if packet 1 goes on this path and packet 2 on this other path, it may turn out that packet 2 arrives first because the delay across this other path may be shorter than the first path. So we need to deal with that. Packets may be lost as well. They may be lost on a link because of link errors. That is, on one particular link, if we're using stop and wait, and we transmit and we keep retransmitting, if we retransmit the maximum number of times, we get an error. The data is not delivered. Or packets may be lost because one of the switching nodes fails. That is, a packet arrives at one packet switching node, and for some reason it fails. The computing device has some error, it turns off, or it's out of memory, and therefore packets may be lost. The packets contain headers so that the switches know where to send them. So the header would include the address of their destination. Because each packet needs to get to the one destination, the packet switching nodes need to know where they need to send to reach that destination. Circuit, virtual circuit packet switching will explain after this example. So this shows the flow of packets in some example packet switching network using datagram packet switching. Have a source wants to send three packets to the destination. So for example, 3,000 bytes, it breaks that data into three packets, attaches a header to each, sends them one at a time to the first packet switching node. So here, we'd send packet one and then packet two and packet three. And that's across the first link from that source computer. When packet one arrives at the first packet switching node, it would look at the header. The header should in at least include that the destination, let's call this S and this D, the header would include a field which indicates the destination is computer D, some address of computer D. And the packet switching node would make a decision, OK, I need to get this packet to computer D. I will send it, let's say, across this link. The decision to determine what link to send across, we will look at this specific algorithms when we cover the next topic of routing. That is, what is the best path from here to here? That's part of routing. Let's say we just choose a path in this case. And we send it in this direction. Then packet 2 arrives at the switching node and it does the same thing, decides to send. 
And eventually, okay, let's say they all three packets were sent to this second packet switching node. And then at some point in time, because we only transmit one packet at a time across a link, this packet switching node received packet one and transmits packet one in this direction and received packet two and is transmitting packet two in this direction and at the same time is receiving packet three. A packet switching node has an input and an out output link. So we can be transmitting packets belonging to our original data and at the same time receiving packets that belong to the original data. And we'll see how that helps in terms of performance a little bit later. So packets one and two went in this direction and for some reason this node decides to send packet three in this direction. This packet switching node does not care that packet three is in fact related to one and two. Even though the source knows that packets 1 and 2 and 3 carry this original data, the packet switching node doesn't. It doesn't care about the contents, it just cares about getting the packets to the destination. That's what I mean, the packets may take different paths to the destination. The, part, the best path to take is part of routing. And because the packets take different paths, the delay of a packet along a path depends upon transmission delay across each link. The time to get a packet from here to here depends upon the time to transmit that packet, propagation de delay of the link, and also any delay in the packet switching nodes themselves, processing and queuing delay. So it may be that going along this path, a packet will arrive here before packets one and two. That is, packet 3 arrives before packet 1 and 2. That is, they arrive out of order. And therefore, in datagram packet switching, it's up to usually either the last node in the network or in the path or even the destination node to put those back into order. Because this 3,000 bytes of data, if it was a 3,000 byte file, we split it into the first, the second, and the third part when we put it back together, it has to be in the right order for the data to make sense. So packets may arrive out of order. We need to reorder them at the destination and then deliver them to the final. In this case, we reorder the packets at this last datagram packet switching node in the network and deliver them to the destination station, to the destination computer. So that's datagram packet switching. We have data to send. We no, long, no longer are talking about sending signals all the way across the network. We're deal, dealing with binary data, bits. We take our data, our original data, and divide it into packets. They may be varying size. In our example, they're all 1,000 bytes. They may vary in size. Usually, there'll be an upper size, or upper limit on the size, no more than so many bytes. They contain a header at least to indicate who the destination node is because when this switch receives a packet it looks at the header, realizes the destination is D therefore realizes, okay, to reach D, reach D I will send to here. That seems like the best path there. Packets contain data and a header and they were sent through the network independently of each other no relationship between the packets from the perspective of the switching nodes. We'll compare performance and other characteristics after we go through the, the next approach. Virtual circuit packet switching. <coughs> Again using packet switching, same concept, take our data, break it into packets, transmit those packets across the network to the destination. But in this case, we try to behave like circuit switching. Circuit switching had this nice characteristic that the data all went across one circuit, one path. 
and that meant we could do things like give performance guarantees, know that the data will always have the same delay. Virtual circuit packet switching breaks the data into packets, sends packets through the network, but sends them along one path, a virtual path, a virtual connection or a virtual circuit. So we have similar steps to real circuit switching. Set up a circuit before we send data, a virtual circuit, and when we finish sending data, close that virtual circuit or tear down that connection. Because we set up a circuit, we in fact choose a path for our data to take, and once that circuit is set up, all the packets follow the same path. And that's a significant difference to datagram packet switching where packets may take different paths. Here, they all take the same path. As a result, they'll arrive in order. Because if I send packet 1, then packet 2, then packet 3, the first switch will receive 1, 2, then 3, and send on to the next switch, 1, 2, and 3. Of course, if we lose packets, we may not get them all at the destination. Again, packets need headers so that the switch knows where to send it. Let's go through our example. That was datagram packet switching. The concept with virtual circuits is we have a packet switching network. The switches forward packets, but we try to emulate this concept of circuit switching where we have a connection between a pair of nodes and we set up that connection or circuit and then send data. It tries to take advantage of the, the benefits of circuit switching but uses packet switching. And we'll explain later that packet switching compared to real circuit switching can be more, more efficient in some cases. So an example, the dashed line indicates a circuit has a virtual circuit has been set up between the source and destination. So initially this node wants to connect and transfer data to the destination. It sends a special packet through the network saying I want to connect to destination D, a connect request. We drew this morning the diagram of in circuit switching we send some special signal to the destination, a connect request, allocate resources and get a response and then send the data. Well, that's what we do here. We send a special packet through the network, send it to this switching node, and this decides will it accept this virtual circuit or not? Does it have resources for this connection, possibly? And then sends that special packet, this connect request, onto the subsequent switches. Once it reaches here, if this one accepts the connection, it responds with a special acknowledgement saying I accept that connection and then we can send our data. So that's what this diagram shows. Once we've set up that path or circuit, we send the data along that path. And, but we send it as packets and the packets all follow the same path. So they all go along that path and so long as none of them are lost, they'll arrive in order at the destination. So that's a comparison, or that's the difference between datagram packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. We'll spend some time now comparing them in terms of performance and different characteristics. Let's, before we go into the next slide, let's talk about the advantage of packet switching compared to circuit switching. Real, so packet switching versus real circuit switching. We saw the disadvantage of circuit switching this morning. If we reserve a resource, when we set up a connection, we reserve the resource for that link and for those circuit switching nodes, then no one else can use that resource. In packet switching, that's not always true. What we can do, because we're using packets, we can store the packets and send them at a later time. Let's try and illustrate that. <coughs> a 
try and get the similar example as, as this morning. We have links with particular capacity. We'll concentrate on this one. And there may be other nodes which we'll not draw in detail. That is, there may be other switching nodes attached to here and many other stations wanting to send through these nodes. But let's concentrate on what may happen across this link. With packet switching, we send our packets along the path, whether using dat datagram or virtual circuit. Let's just concentrate the packets are going al along this path. The switching nodes, when they receive packets, look at the header, determine where to send it, and send it. But if they don't have the resources to send it at that point in time, they may store those packets, save them in memory, in a queue. And that's how we can be more efficient than the circuit switching. Let's see. Let's say that our source is trying to send at some data rate of first one megabit per second from source to D using packet switching. Then it sends its packets to the first switch. There's capacity on this link to send them on. And in fact, there's enough capacity on all the links to deliver them through the network, so long as no one else is sending on this path at this point in time. There's enough capacity on all the links for the source to be able to deliver to D at a rate of one megabit per second. But we introduce if there's another pair of nodes wanting to send data as well. Maybe there's another node here as a source and another node here as a destination, let's say. A sending to B. And we'll assume that this pair of nodes want to send their data across this link. If A is wanting to send to B and is transmitting at one megabit per second, so long as these links support it, from this link's perspective, it should be OK. This link can support 10 megabits per second. If we have one pair sending at one megabit per second across that link, and another pair sending at one megabit per second across that link, it should be OK. They both get their one megabit per second. And we could see that we could handle 10 pairs of nodes sending across that one link. 10, all sending at one megabit per second, sending at, uh, using the full capacity of 10 megabits per second. What happens, so let's say we have the first pair of nodes, the second, and then we have the tenth pair. We saw this morning with circuit switching, that's OK. The problem with circuit switching is if suddenly the source is not sending at 1 megabit per second, it drops down to, say, 200 kilobits per second. Then with circuit switching, that's wasting 800 kilobits per second of resource allocated. In packet switching, if the source drops down to 200 kilobits per second, then packets from other nodes can still be delivered across that link. So if we have our 11th pair from who's also trying to deliver their packets across this link, then if they are sending at 1 megabit per second and the other 10 are also sending at 1 megabit per second, what's going to happen across this link? So we've got 11 pairs sending at 1 megabit per second. Let's say all into here, so we've got 1, 2, 11 coming into this packet switching node at a total of 1 megabit per second. This can only send along here at 10 megabits per second. What happens? Speed goes slower, but why? Yeah, but more specifically, what happens at this node? We're sending in, so the total coming into this node is 11 megabits per second. So what we do at this packet switching node, we have a buffer or a memory. And so there's a total of 11 coming in. 
it can only send 10 out, therefore it'll have to start storing some of the packets in memory and send them later. So we'll start to fill up the buffer. But if it's only for a short period of time that they're all sending at 11 megabits per second, then if they're all sending at 11 megabits per second, we're only going out at 10, every second there'll be an extra 1 megabit in the buffer. Okay, if we have 11 coming in every second, 10 going out every second, it means we need to store 1 in the buffer every second. But if then slightly later this one drops down to 200 kilobits per second, that is the sending rate of this one, and also maybe this one, then the total we have, we have 2 at 200, and we have 9 at 1 megabit per second, so 9.4 megabits per second, we have some spare capacity there. That is, we have coming in at total of 9.4, coming out at 10, so we can use that spare 0.6 megabit per second to send what's in the buffer. So what packets were stored in the buffer can now be transmitted across this link. The end result is that when everyone was sending at 1 megabit per second, creating a total in of 11, some packets get buffered and they get delayed in that buffer. But if some of the sources start to slow down, such that the total coming in is less than what we can send out, then those packets in the buffer can be transmitted out. They catch up, really. As a result, and if this changes over time, as a result, the, the problem with sending more in than we can send out is that we get more packets stored in the buffer and more, or an increase in queuing delay. The packets are queued inside that switching node. So the queuing delay goes up, but eventually the packets got transmitted. Because, out of luck, these two slowed down, it gave an opportunity to transmit those packets out on that link. So eventually they get sent through. And so this is the, the benefit of using packet switching. If the source sending rates vary over time, then we still can make efficient use of the network resources, of the links, by storing the packets. That is, when they're sending a lot, we'll have to store some of the packets in the buffer. When they're not sending as much as the capacity, those packets can be sent through. So the trade-off that we have here is that we allow, here we're allowing 11 pairs of node to communicate. In circuit switching, we were fixed at 10. And we were inefficient in circuit switching when the, some of the sources reduced their sending rate. In packet switching, we can allow more pairs of node to share that resource at the expense that at some times, when they're all sending the maximum rate, that their packets will be delayed. The queuing delay will go up. But when they reduce their sending rate, they'll get what they require, and their packets will go through. Yeah, yeah, or more generally, you can th think if the buffer is full, we'll start to lose packets. Lose packets. Yeah. Or you have to allow the no, don't send now, or not, not like that. I mean, we could do that. I mean, that could be applied across all links, stop and wait, and so on. Uh, but assuming in, in a general network, we don't know what's being used across each link. We cannot force every link to use stop and wait, for example. They, some may not use any flow control. So, yeah, we'll lose packets. And, of course, that will have an impact on our applications and we'll need other ways to deal with that. Yeah? Yes, uh, that is, if we look at what happens every second, in the first second, 
everyone was sending at one megabit per second. So in that first one second, there were 11 coming in, 10 going out. That means one megabit was buffered, stored in memory. In the next second, if these two slow down, then there's 9.4 coming in from those sources. And therefore, we have this spare of 0.6 megabit per second to send from the buffer. That's one way to think of it. So we can transmit in that one second of that one megabit of buffer 600 kilobits. So as the sending rates of the sources go up and down, statistically we get the opportunity to deliver the packets from the buffer through the network. Yes, we store, store the packets instead of Im immediately delivering them. In the circuit switching, our, si our data simply goes through the circuit, uh -huh. goes through the switch. There's no buffering, no storage there. So the than this. Yeah. 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 So when there are more connections, does that, does that mean uh, the throughput is decreased? So it depends on what happens over time now. So we just looked at a, a small time instant of what happened. That is, for one second, these two, or for one second, 11 of the pairs had an increase in delay of their packets. But because the next second, two of the pairs slowed down, the others still get all their data through. So they still get their full throughput, but their delay has been increased. So the more, in general, the more, uh, the more pairs sending through the network, the higher the delay is going to be incurred for those end-to-end -end applications. And yes, they need to share that total bandwidth between those connections. So if they were all sending at one megabit per second all the time, then we'd have a problem because we'd always have 11 coming in and 10 going out. So we'd be basically sharing this 10 megabits per second by 11 pairs of nodes. So if they're always sending at the maximum all the time, then each of them will be getting 10, out, 10 divided by 11, which is what, 900 kilobits per second, a lower throughput. But if the sources vary over time, then source, the fir first source requires a throughput of 1 megabit per second. It gets that and then slightly later only needs 200 kilobits per second and they may achieve that as well. So depending on the variance of the sending rates it may even out and it can be much more efficient than circuit switching. So in packet switching networks queuing delay is significant. You can sometimes relate packet switching networks to, say, driving through the, the streets in Bangkok where the packet switching nodes are the intersections, the stoplights. If you have many roads coming in and many cars coming in on those roads, the weight that you'll have to have at the stoplights will increase. The queue will increase. But if there's not many cars coming in to the intersection, there'll be very short waiting time at the stoplights and then you'll flow through. And unfortunately, we don't lose cars. We, our queue just gets larger. Sometimes it would be nice to... Yeah, maybe. So that's the trade-offs that we have with circuit switching versus packet switching. With, and that's why packet switching is much better suited to applications where the data sending rate varies over time. Your web browser, sometimes you're sending nothing, Sometime you need to send a lot. And the person sitting next to you, their web browser, when you're sending nothing, maybe they want to send something. So we take advantage of this and that on average, over a long period of time, 
even though sometimes they all want to send at 1 megabit per second, if on average they all sending less than 10 megabits per second, we should be okay in terms of performance. Sometimes they may want to send more, in which case the queuing delay will go up. But is if on average over a long period of time they all in total want to send less than 10 megabits per second, we'll be able to support that traffic through the network. And that's not what circuit switching will allow. <coughs> that's comparing packet switching in general to circuit switching. What about some other ways to compare or, or look at the different characteristics? Coming back to our example here, we said we had 3,000 bytes of original data and we divided it into three packets. We said the maximum size was 1,000 bytes. What's the best maximum size? This illustrates. So these are four cases using packet switching whether it's datagram packet switching or virtual circuit packet switching, it's when the data is being delivered. What it shows is the source, the destination, and two intermediate nodes. Let's draw them. And there are four different cases of different packet sizes. So we have a network that, or a path that looks like this. We have X, A, B, and Y. A path from our source to destination with three links. And it's trying to illustrate the impact of using different maximum packet sizes. So we want to transfer data from X to Y. Let's say the first case, what have we got? Let's say we have 10,000 bytes of data in total. Case one, the diagram on the left, let's say that each packet contains 10,000 bytes plus header. And so in case one, if we have 10,000 bytes of original data and in case one we can handle 10,000 bytes in one packet, plus some header, then this is an illustration of what happens with regard to transmission time. So if we start transmitting our packet, here we just need one packet to transfer all the data. So we start transmitting the packet, so it shows the header plus the data. The header may be, let's say, 100 bytes and the data of 10,000 bytes. This is the time it takes to transmit. Start transmitting, finish transmitting. That's transmitting from X to A across the first link. With packet switching, the switching nodes must receive the entire packet. They may buffer it. And then they can send across the next link. In this case, there's no buffering. There's, in fact, the, trans the propagation delay is not even shown. It's just showing the transmission delay. Transmit the first packet across the first link. Start here, finish at this time. So now the packet, packet 1, has arrived at node A. Now this one looks at the header, determines it needs to go to Y, and transmits that one packet across the second link. And that's illustrated here. We, after A receives the packet, it transmits the entire packet to the B. When B receives that packet, it sends it on to Y, the destination. So the total time to transmit that 10,000 bytes of data from X to Y is start here, finish here. Total transmission time. we can see we can pipeline that data. We can be better. The second case, let's put a number to it. Let's say the maximum size of a packet is 5,000 bytes plus a header. And 
just to give a number, let's say the header in each case is 100 bytes. Maybe to scale a bit better, maybe 1,000 bytes, I think. Yeah. So in the first case, we had a 10,000 byte, or we had a packet with 10,000 bytes of data plus some header. In the second case, we've got 10,000 bytes of original data. We have a maximum packet size that supports 5,000 bytes of data. So we need two packets, each containing 5,000 bytes, each containing a header. And we see what can happen here. X transmits packet 1 to b node A, and then starts transmitting packet 2. So we transmit packets in order, 1 and then 2. But after A had received packet 1, it can start transmitting to B. So that's what's shown here. At the same time as packet 2 is being transmitted from X to A, across the first link, packet 1 is being transmitted from A to B across the second link. This is happening at the same time. So we're, we're sort of doing this. And then we can continue to do that. Packet 2 can then be transmitted from A to B at the same time as packet 1 from B to the destination. And finally, packet 2 is sent from B to Y, the destination. During this period, here and here, we've got this pipelining effect. We're sending data in the network across two links at the same time. And that saves us total time. Total time from here to here is less than when we use the larger packet. By using smaller packets, we can get this advantage of allowing packets to be sent in the network across different links at the same time saving total transmission time. That is, we've reduced the total transmission time, which is the, the positive part. And the next case, it's even better. Case three, if we have 2,000 bytes of data plus a header, then we <coughs> can pipeline three packets through the network. Packet 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 need to be transmitted across the first link. But it turns out when we're transmitting packet 1 across the last link, we can be transmitting packet 2 across the second link and packet 3 across the first link. So we're saving time in transmitting because we're doing some of the transmissions at the same time. As a result, the total transmission time is less. Make the packet size even smaller. 1,000 bytes. Case 4. Plus a header. And in all the cases, the header size is fixed, and which is typical in a particular technology. What happens? This one is longer. We don't have an improvement in transmission time. Why? Because we have a lot of header to send. In this case, we just had over each link transmit one header. In this case, one, two headers across each link. The more header we transmit, the more transmission time of our data and the less efficient will be. In this case, five headers were transmitted across each link. By breaking it into even smaller packets, we need to send a lot of header across the transmission link. And as a result, in this scenario, the total transmission time increases. So that's, there's a trade-off there. Choose a packet size that is small, that allows us to pipeline the packets through the network, but large enough such that the header is not a significant impact on the performance. So there's a trade-off between the, 
the packet, packet size there. Choose a, choose a packet size that is small enough that allows us to pipeline those packets through the network. When I say pipeline, it mean, I mean across the different links, we'd like to be transmitting a packet across each link at the same time. Ideally, I should be transmitting packets across this link at the same time as I'm transmitting some packets across this link and across this link. That is, use all links at the same time. By having smaller packets, we can do that. It depends upon the number of links. But we don't want to get a packet too small because the amount of header relative to the packets or the the amount of header that we need to transmit across each link increases. If you add up the blue boxes, of course it's double the amount of header that we have in this case. And it's ten times as much as in this case. So we need to choose the appropriate trade-off there. Yes, so, and this shows the inefficiency in terms of the transmission time. The efficiency here, or we can think of the throughput, in all cases we've got the same amount of original data. So the throughput is simply the amount of original data, 10,000 bytes, divided by the total time. So if we can decrease the total time, we'll get a better throughput and better efficiency. That is long total time, low throughput, the shortest total time, the highest throughput. It also of course depends upon the number of links. In this example we have three links. If we had four links in our path, that is another one, then the results may be different in terms of comparing these four because if we have four links, this one we well this one would be okay because we have five packets and we can pipeline across those links. If we had ten links, then the best case here, in this one when we have one packet, the best case is that we can be transmitting across one link at the same time. When we have two packets, the best case we can be transmitting across two links at the same time. Packet one across one link, packet two across another link. If we have five packets, we could utilize all five links at the same time. If we have ten packets, we could utilize ten links at the same time. Increasing the number of links in the path means that we would need more packets, smaller packets, to be able to fully utilize the network at the same time. So this is looking at just packet switching, either virtual circuit or datagram, same concepts, and looking at the impact of the packet size on performance. What else do we have? Comparing all three real circuit switching, virtual circuit packet switching, datagram packet switching. In the first two cases we need to establish a circuit before we transmit data. In terms of the total time to transmit the data that introduces an overhead. In circuit switching we send this special call request signal and we get some response and then we transmit data. And in circuit switching, once we have the circuit established, we transmit the data. So this shows the transmission time. And here to here shows the propagation delay. So if we have 10,000 bytes of data at some data rate, if this is the transmission time in circuit switching, then the data, you can think the signal is transmitted, it takes some time to propagate across the first link, 
And with circuit switching, once the circuit is established, it's as if the switching node, the signal goes straight through it. So in fact, the signal arrives at the first switch and is immediately sent on across the next link and arrives at the second switch and is immediately sent along across the third link. So, like we've said before, when we have a circuit established, it's as if we have a link from source all the way through to destination. You can remove these lines to think about how long it will take to transmit and propagate. Time to transmit, time to propagate from here to here. Propagation depends upon the link distance. Three links, if they're all, all links of the same distance, same propagation time, the more links, the longer propagation. Calculate throughput. When we calculate the throughput, it depends upon are we just considering this case or do we think that in the future there'll be more data sent? If, if all we care about is this case, we'd think of, okay, the time from when we want to start transmitting the data until when it's fully received. If we, if we assume, which is the case in real life, that someone transmits this data and then sometime later they do the same thing, they transmit more data and more data, then we'd consider from here to here. That uh, depends upon the exact scenario. What's important here in terms of performance is the total time to complete. At least from here to here. All right. If we say from here to when, from when we want to start transmitting data until the data is fully received. That's a key performance metric when we compare these three. So let's compare them. In circuit switching, we need to set up the connection. That takes time. The time to get a request to the destination and get a response back. You could calculate that. It depends upon the size of the request, the transmission time, and the propagation time. And maybe some processing delay in here. Similar with virtual circuit packet switching. Same concept, except, in fact, we have a packet. It's not some special signal, it's an actual packet with a header. And it comes back. The point, the, the only difference we see is the response. In Circuit switching, normally when we set up the, or send the request, as the request is accepted by each node, that node creates a circuit. So the request comes to node A, node A creates a connection between the appropriate links, the request comes to node B, and the connection is made between the links in circuit switching. When the response, this call accept signal comes back, it simply passes all the way through from Y through to X. So there's no or very, very small processing delay at the intermediate nodes for the response. Whereas with virtual circuit packet switching, a packet always needs to be fully received, processed, and then sent. So transmit the packet, the packet has arrived in its entirety, maybe some small processing time, then transmit the packet on the next link. It's arrived and then transmit. So there's a slightly larger delay involved there. It's not that significant. It's more significant when we look at the data. Of course with datagram packet switching we avoid all of that. We just send the packets into the network. No setting up a connection. The second one is the virtual yeah, circuit switching. Second one, virtual circuit packet switching. And the third one, datagram packet switching.
Now let's look at the data transfer. So these two have set up a connection. The data transfer here and here are the same. That is the same as what we looked at in the previous diagram. With circuit switching, we've set up a circuit, we transmit that data, and the signal representing that data flows from source to destination. No processing at any intermediate nodes. So let's give some numbers to our simple network. Let's say our propagation delay across each link is 10 milliseconds, just to give some numbers. All links are the same distance. <coughs> and the transmission delay, if we had 10,000 bytes of data, let's give a transmission delay of to transmit 10,000 bytes of 100 milliseconds to transmit all of the data. So with circuit switching, the total time from when we start to transmit the data to when it's received, the first node starts transmitting. The first bit or the first piece of information, piece of data transmitted, propagates across the link and immediately propagates or then propagates across the next link and the final link. So the total time is the time it takes X to transmit the data plus the time it takes for all of that to propagate across the path. Transmission is 100 milliseconds. The path propagation The propagation of a signal across this link is 10 plus 10 plus 10 is 30. Therefore, the total delay, 130 milliseconds. That is the time from here to here. 100 to transmit, 30 to propagate. Because there's no processing at the intermediate nodes. That's with circuit switching. That's for all of the data. That's for all of the data. So in our scenario, our source wants to send 10,000 bytes to the destination, and that's it. In circuit switching, we establish a circuit. We transfer the data as either an analog or digital signal, and then we're done. So this is for circuit switching. The first one, that's this one. Circuit, virtual circuit, datagram. That's really the calculation of the transmission plus the propagation. So the time from here to here would be 130. We haven't calculated the time for this. We could if we had some numbers. Because circuit switching is dealing with the, the transmission of signals across a circuit. Not dealing with packets, we have data to send. If we have 10,000 bytes of data to send, we just transmit that data as a signal, analog or digital, from the source to the first node. And the signal passes through the first node and goes from the first node to the second node, and passes through the second node and goes to the destination. So in effect, that signal goes from source across the three links to the destination. So the time to transmit is simply the initial transmission time. The time to propagate is the time to propagate across all three links, which is this, our path propagation time. Any questions on that one before we move on? Uh, 
These two are both packet switching. With packet switching, we're not dealing with the underlying signal. We, we need to transmit a packet, a sequence of bytes, receive that packet, and then process that packet, and then send it on the next link. So originally, we, in our calculation, we had 10,000 bytes of data. So if we divide that data into three packets, then let's, so what do we have, 3,300 bytes. We had a transmission time of 10,000 bytes of 100 milliseconds. If we divide by three, we get 33, but we also need to transmit a header for both forms of packet switching. Let's say the transmission time of a packet, just to give a number, is 35 milliseconds. Transmission of one packet. So the transmission time of three packets would be 105 milliseconds. Slightly longer than transmitting 10,000 bytes because we have header as well. Uh, in this example, we had the amount of data to get from source to destination, 10,000 bytes. And in our packet switching examples, we're going to divide that into three packets. Because this diagram uses three packets only. Yes, yeah, so transmission of 10,000 is 100 milliseconds. Transmission of each packet would be at least 33.3 .3 milliseconds, one third, plus some header. So let's make a, a nice number of 35. Time to transmit one packet, 35 milliseconds. So what happens? We can look at either this one or this one. It's the same from this point onwards. Source transmits the first packet across the first link. So the time from here to here is 35 milliseconds. And then we'll transmit the second packet and the third packet. But of course the packet takes time to propagate across the first link. So let's draw it. The first packet start at time zero. Packet one finish transmitting at 35, then we'll transmit the second packet and the third packet. So from the source, transmit one packet after another. The three packets, that is these three. And then each packet takes time to propagate across the link. 10 milliseconds is our propagation for a link in this example. So, packet one would start to arrive at time 10. If we start at transmitting at time zero, the first bit would arrive at time 10. But the entire packet doesn't arrive in time, until time 45. So now we've received the entire packet, and we must receive the entire packet before we process and determine where do we send it next. So this node, who is it? In this diagram, that node 1, 2, and 3, in our example, X, A, B, and Y. But the second node here has received the packet and can now transmit on the next link. Assuming no processing delay or very small processing delay, once we've received the entire packet, we can transmit. We start transmitting on the second link at time 45. We'd finish at time, what is it, 80. It takes 35. We start at 45, we'll finish at 80. While we're transmitting this, this packet on this link, we're actually receiving the next packet on the first link. This node has an input link, one cable coming in, and at least one cable going out, an output link. So it's in fact receiving packets and transmitting packets at the same time. 
So in fact, we receive packet 2, finish transmitting at time 70, we receive it at time 80 with a 10 millisecond propagation delay. And we finish transmitting packet 1 at time 80, we receive packet 2 at time 80, so now let's transmit packet 2 across the second link. And similar for packet 3 at time 115, 105 plus 10 propagation, 115, and transmit. 150. Assume zero processing, very small processing. If we had processing, we could incorporate it in there. Instead of transmitting at 45, if I said a three, set, three millisecond processing, we'd receive it at 45, transmit at 48. That's all. We, we process, but we just say it takes a very small time. We, so we receive it, we process it, but it takes one nanosecond. And I'm not going to draw that on the diagram. Uh, we still need to receive the entire packet before we do something with it. So we receive the packet, maybe we do some error detection on that packet, check it has no errors, look at the header. Yes, it takes time, but let's say it takes a very small time, and then we transmit that entire packet. <coughs> And so that's what we see happening here. Transmit three, wait until the first one's fully received, then start transmitting that, and then the same across the next link. And if we trans finished transmitting the first one at 80, at plus 10, it would arrive at 90. And you'll see the similar pattern. The packet 1 arrives at this node at time 90 in its entirety and therefore we can start transmitting packet 1 along the next link at time 90 and therefore packet 1 will arrive at the destination at time so 90 we finish at plus 35, 125. Packet 1 we started transmitting at 90, finished at 125 plus 10 propagation, packet 1 arrives at the destination at time 135. Packet 2, you can go back and calculate, would arrive 35 milliseconds later. And packet 3 the total time to transmit those three packets across our network, 205 milliseconds. That is the time from here to here. In circuit switching, 130, using the same numbers from here to here. Because of two reasons. In circuit switching, we don't have header, but that's only a small part. Importantly, with circuit switching, we don't have this waiting for the data at the intermediate nodes. The signal goes right through the intermediate nodes. In packet switching, the signal is received at the first node and we wait until we receive the entire packet and then send it on. That adds the extra time. And in fact, this one is the same as here. If we start at zero, we finish at 205. So it takes more time to transmit the same amount of data. Is that the right number? Uh, let's check then. Let's follow a different way. It took from 0 to 105 to transmit. Let's follow the last bit that's transmitted. The last bit is transmitted at 105. It takes 10 to propagate. It will arrive at time 115. 
Then we transmit another 35, brings us up to 150. And that last bit will take 10 to propagate, which is 160. Sorry, my diagram's not good. Here, 160. Another 35 to transmit, which is 195. And another 10 to propagate. The last bit arrives at time 205. So if you follow our red line, Total time is the transmission of the th first of the three packets across the first link, plus that last packet across the second link and across the last link, plus the three propagation delays. Two hundred and five milliseconds. If you change the number of links. Of course, if we had another link, we'd need to transmit that last packet and that would have another transmission time and another propagation time. So this is showing the comparison in terms of performance of the total time to transfer the data. Which one's better of those three? All right, let's say better in terms of throughput or total transmission time. So let's compare. We only have five minutes left. Let's compare in terms of the total time to transmit our data. We know with packet switching compared to circuit switching, we have an extra overhead. That is, packet switching this time, this time will always be more than this because we have extra header plus this time waiting at intermediate nodes. This will always be larger than this given the same amount of data. But both of these have a connection set up. That's an extra time waiting. So they're not much different between here and here, but compared to datagram packet switching, that doesn't have that connection set up. So there's no one answer as to which ones will be shorter. It depends on the parameters. But in general, if we have a large amount of data to send, then the connection setup will be quite minor, insignificant. Imagine this was not 10,000 bytes, but 10 million bytes. If you drew this, It'd be this, followed by a large block of data transfer. The connection setup would be just a very small percentage of the total transfer. So with a large amount of data transferred, the ones using connection setup are not much different from using datagram packet switching. Because the only benefit, of, in terms of total time, the only advantage here compared to here is the saving on the connection setup. And the other thing is that, of course, circuit switching in terms of the data transfer only will always be better than the packet switching approaches. So which one's better? It depends upon the scenario. That how much data we're being, how much data is being transferred, how many links do we have, how much header is included in the packets. In general, if we have a small amount of data, Datagram packet switching would be better. Not always, but in general, or in, in most cases, because it avoids the connection setup. If the data, if we have a large amount of data, uh, if we have a large amount of data, then normally this, this will be will be better or faster because we don't have the overhead of headers. And the more data, the more headers we need to transmit. And we don't have this waiting time at intermediate nodes. So a large amount of data and the connection set up is just a small percentage of the total time and therefore insignificant. 
Yes, we can go all the way through without stopping. It's as if it's if you're a politician and you can have the the traffic lights turn green from here to Chiang Mai. You can drive at 100 kilometres an hour all the way there. So you set up a circuit before you transfer the data, and therefore that's much faster. Here, you need to go to the first intersection, stop, go to the inspect, stop, move on, and so on. So this is extra. It's not exactly the best comparison, but it's uh, similar. Yes, if you transfer that if data by post. If you in the large yeah. amount, we send the truck, it's OK. But if you send in the small amount, we send by post, it's, it's, it's better. Yes, that's more about packet size and the yeah. overhead. Yeah, that's true. The last slide here gives some comparison between those three approaches or, or the mechanisms of each of those three approaches. Some of them we've seen, some are not so relevant. Um, Circuit switching, we have a dedicated transmission path. We have a path from source to destination. And the other two approaches, there's no dedicated physical path. Virtual circuit connection, a virtual, virtual circuit packet switching, we choose a path, but the, the links through the switching nodes are not allocated for that path all the time. That is, here we have a path all the way through, straight through the switching nodes. In these cases, we don't. What else? All right, we transmit packets. We may store packets when we use packet switching. That introduces, introduces that extra time. We store packets and then send them on. That's useful if we don't have enough capacity to send right now. We can store them and send them later. What else? The problem with circuit switching is if the resources are used by or have been allocated, then a new connection cannot be accepted. It'd be blocked or the net network says the network is considered busy. In terms of the packet switching, if we send more than what the capacity is, the packet delay will go up. But maybe only for a short time if we vary the transmission rates over time. Some aspects of the implementation, I think that's the main points that we've covered. Uh, one thing I don't know if we've mentioned, that in circuit switching, the source and the destination must use the same transmission speed that, that I said this morning then in packet switching they don't have to. That is, in packet switching my source can transmit, have a link that allows me to transmit at 10 megabits per second and this link can support just 1 megabit per second. That's possible. Not so in circuit switching. If we try to transmit at 10 megabits per second and this one can only support 1 megabit per second, what's going to happen is packets are eventually going to be queued the buffer delay will go up. But it's possible. And that's it, I think. We've covered circuit and packets.